Hello, I'm Eric Waite, and this is uh, part two of our lesson on uh, alleged discrepancies of the Bible in our series on uh, bibliology. If you haven't watched the previous uh, lessons on this, I highly recommend you do so, for each lesson is building on the next. Now, the topic of alleged discrepancies is uh, huge. I provided in the last lesson a list of uh, books that uh, will enable you to go further into this. What I am doing in this lesson is rather than cover every argument or every alleged discrepancy that is out there, I'm instead covering the six topics or six subjects within alleged discrepancies, which are genealogical problems, quotation problems, scientific problems, doctrinal problems, ethical problems, and historical problems. So in the previous lessons, I covered one through five. In this lesson, I'm going to cover historical problems, which will also include archaeological problems. Now, when you're dealing with a skeptic, when you're dealing with someone who asks questions or brings up arguments, you have to keep three things in mind. Different people ask different questions for different reasons. One is the person who actually wants the, the, to know the truth. They actually want an answer. These are people I will spend time with and will seek to answer the question. Um, second is those who, they're obstinate, they're going to hold to their worldview and rebellion against the word of God. They want to hold on to their sin of unbelief and everything else that flows from that. So when they're bringing up arguments or asking questions, they really don't want to know the truth. They are instead trying to develop uh, an apologetic, a defense for what they believe in. So no matter what you say to them, it is not going to uh, provide a solution to them. They're not going to really, really listen to it. They're not going to accept it. I shared a video clip in my last video, in the first part of this lesson, in which Richard Dawkins, well-known atheist, readily admits he will not follow the scientific method if it leads him to uh, the Christian worldview. Uh, he will not follow his preconceived or uh, presupposed scientific method if it leads him to a belief in the Christian worldview. And there is an ethical and moral reason to that. It's not about science. It's about holding on to a particular worldview. So if you didn't see that clip, I highly recommend going and watch part one of this lesson. The third is one who is merely looking for bits and pieces of sound clips that they can then use in the media, social media, uh, to uh, fortify your case. And so typically they'll take bits and pieces of information, things you've said, things that have been written, they'll take it out of context and then use it to sort of further their, their agenda. This is real, real, real common with the media. And so you always have to keep in mind that um, we're not to answer a fool according to his folly, but rather answer his folly in the way in which it deserves. Jesus encountered this with the Pharisees and the scribes who didn't want to know the truth. They merely wanted sound bites to use against him, particularly inciting people against him and particularly uh, the uh, Roman uh, government who, who was in power. So a lot of times when they're asking questions, they don't want to know the truth. They just want to remain uh, obstinate in their own agenda. So you have to keep in mind, why are people asking the questions or bringing up the arguments that, that they have? Now, there are people who will, may have heard things because they that are incorrect, uh, alleged discrepancies, because they are a part of a, uh, a church or denomination that doesn't hold to the Christian worldview. Perhaps it's been influenced by a liberal seminary. Perhaps they're hearing this in a liberal seminary. Perhaps they're hearing this uh, in a university. And a lot of the arguments that get brought up, a lot of the alleged discrepancies that are brought up have been brought up over and over and over again for hundreds of years, and they've already been answered. They've already been resolved. They've been resolved by uh, internal evidence within Scripture. They've been answered and resolved from archaeological evidence and so forth. But they will continue to repeat these errors, repeat these arguments, repeat these alleged discrepancies hoping that those who are listening to them will not have heard the answer. But if you 
research the books, read the books that I provided in the previous lesson, and I'll put them in the description box down below. You find that most of these have already been answered, but the university professor, uh, the seminary professor, the liberal pastor, a liberal theologian, or the modern skeptic will just continue to repeat them, even though they've already been uh, refuted. So uh, one of the most common arguments that are brought up is the issue of Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2. It is often argued that there is a contradiction or conflict between Genesis 1 and Gen Genesis chapter 2. So our first topic, uh, the, or really the final topic we're, we're dealing with in, in this particular lesson on alleged discrepancies, is the issue of historical problems. Now, the issue of Genesis 1, Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2 has already been responded to, has already been refuted, and yet it'll keep coming up over and over and over again. Bottom line is, this is found throughout the Bible, not only in the book of Genesis, but throughout the Pentateuch, throughout the law, throughout the prophets, and throughout the New Testament, including uh, the book of Revelation, is a way of conveying a story that first you sort of tell a brief synopsis of the event or the story, and then you repeat it and you expound on it and tell it over again. This is found in the book of Revelation. If you check out the commentary by uh, William Hendrickson, uh, More Than Conquerors, William Hendrickson lays out the structure of the book of Revelation uh, in that it tells the same sort of events or story and expounds on it over and over and over again. So the picture is, imagine if you had scrolls within a scroll within a scroll, and as you continue to open the scroll, you get more and more information each time that it's opened up. And so uh, if you study uh, the literary style of the Bible, uh, of particularly of, of the Hebrew Bible, you'll find this over and over again. Where there's a short synopsis of an event and then an expounding on that event. And that's exactly what we have with Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2. So there is no contradiction that this is not a discrepancy. It's not like you had two different authors and somehow they stupidly put them together in the Pentateuch. Oh, gee, I didn't realize this other count conflicts with the one I'm adding. You know, as if you have two different, you know, chefs who have different ways of making something. They took two different things and put them together, you know, in the same book, you know, as if a redactor or an editor couldn't figure out that, hey, this, by adding both of these accounts, somehow creates a contradiction. You know, they weren't that stupid. Anyway, but it's literary ignorance that leads them to this conclusion. And, they're, and the reality is they're not willing to look any further to realize, no, this is just a style of writing. And the funny thing is, this style of conveying a story or, or, and talking about events is common today. It's not just some ancient way of writing. If you, and I, there's a lot of examples I could provide, but I'll just, just this one. If you watch the Mission Impossible movies, at the beginning of the movie, uh, as the music is playing, you will get very quickly an entire, in 56 seconds, in a synopsis of the entire movie in 56 seconds. But it doesn't make any sense when you're watching it until you see the whole movie. Then when you watch the entire movie and then go back and watch the beginning, get, you realize, oh, the entire story of the movie was told in that first 56 seconds. So you got dun 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 I couldn't use the audio from the actual intro clip, uh, introduction clip of <laughs> of the movie because I'd get a copyright strike. But if that's exactly what's going on at the beginning of the movie. Is they're telling you the whole movie in 56 seconds, and then they're going to expound on that throughout the next two hours or however long the movie is. Well, all, the Bible does that too. But there's other movies and stories that too. It's, it's often called uh, foreshadowing, where something later on in the story is introduced at the beginning and you really don't know what's going on. And then you later watch, you as you watch the movie, that scene that you saw at the beginning is then repeated and you see it again. And you see it again. Uh, um, Doug Wilson does this in his uh, on his video clips, um, uh, blog and may blog. At the beginning, or, or whoever's editing his videos, at the very beginning, you'll get a five second or 10 second clip 
of something that's said later on, but you don't know exactly what he's talking about. And then as you see it, you see, oh, okay, this is what he was talking about. And then eventually, what you saw at the beginning is then repeated at the end. Okay, it's just a way of t telling stories. Uh, I think Quentin Tarantino does a lot of this. A lot of the movie makers uh, do this sort of thing. So it's a very ancient style of writing and telling a story. So there is no historical conflict between Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2. It's just a, a style of uh, a writing that was common then and is common today. So another type of historical problem that is our apparent historical problem that is often brought up uh, from within the biblical text itself is how it relates to secular historical information, particularly that of archaeology. Uh, many archaeologists and scholars date Israel's exodus from Egypt to be around 1290 BC. This is based primarily on the reference in Genesis 1:11 to the city of Ramses as the site where the Israelite slaves worked. The assumption is that if the city were named Ramses the Great, then the exodus must have taken place after 1300 BC. However, 1 Kings 6:1 says that it was 480 years from the date of the Exodus to the commencement of Solomon's temple in 966 BC, dating the Exodus around 1446 BC, 150 years earlier than supposed. So what is right, the Bible or these scholars? So one of the things you have to keep in mind is because they don't believe in miracles, they don't believe the Bible can have accurate uh, foretelling or prophecy of history, therefore, the events that were prophesied in the Pentateuch that took place during the exile, they say, well, prophecy can't happen. They can't know the future ahead of time. Therefore, the Pentateuch must have been written during the exile as a means of explaining as to why they're in exile. So they have to have a late dating of the Pentateuch. And so they're going to want to argue, well, it wasn't written during Moses' time. It was written during the time of the exile as a way of explaining, well, how come we're under the, 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 the captivity of the, the Babylonians, the Syrians, the, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans? Oh, it must be begin because uh, something happened a long time ago. And so they're making up information about the Exodus and about this prophecy concerning how these stiff-necked people would go into captivity. That's the presupposition they have uh, when reading the text. So they have to come up with an alternate explanation. The problem with this is has to do with the uh, style of writing of the Pentateuch. Now, again, just as I mentioned before about the writing of Genesis 1 and 2 and that style of writing, of the way of, of telling story, that you summarize it and then you expound upon it, then this style of writing is found throughout uh, the Old Testament. It's found in the book of Revelation, uh, as you read in the, the book uh, by William Hendrickson. So also, there was a particular format for a relationship between a Lord and a servant as recorded in the Bible. These are called suzerain treaties. And it's a suzerain treaty that describes a relationship between a suzerain, that is a Lord, and a vassal or a servant. Meredith Klein, who was one of my professors at Westminster Theological Seminary, also taught at Gordon-Conwell, when the, in the 1970s, the discovery of the suzerain treaties uh, came up. And then he, he realized in studying the book of Deuteronomy that the book of Deuteronomy follows this same suzerain uh, format with some adaptations. So this style of writing didn't, wasn't around during the time of the exile. It was around during the time of uh, the exodus during the time of Moses' time. So that style of writing uh, has to, uh, indicates that the Pentateuch was written 1400 BC, not during the time of, uh, of the exile. So the Bible's recording of when the exodus happened is accurate, not only from within the text of scripture, but from just from the genre or style of writing of uh, this the uh, Pentateuch. So there's uh, so Meredith Klein and another gentleman by the name of Ray Sutton have written books on the covenant structure uh, of uh, the, the Bible. The Ray Sutton's is called That You May Prosper. I'm going to do a class on uh, covenant theology 
on the structure of the covenants. We'll look at all of the covenants going throughout the entire Bible, and we'll look and see how there's a fivefold structure that follows th throughout uh, the entire entire Bible, the structure of, of the covenants. So, in terms of um, extra biblical literature, that style of writing uh, didn't exist during the time of, of the exile. But God, it, using this style of writing or, or, or coven structure, is used throughout the Bible. Now, on that note, so, and this is very, 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 very common. There is a way in which we write, say, personal letters versus writing professional letters. If you're representing a corporation and you're writing to another corporation, perhaps, or perhaps you're writing a government letter, there's a particular way and format of writing a letter, which is different than how you would write a letter if you're writing, say, to a friend or to your grandmother. So you can go online, you can search how to write a formal letter or how to write a request, how to write a memorandum and so forth. And you can see that there are different structures for different types of letters. Same thing with writing, say, a, a resume. When uh, there are different styles and types of resumes, depending on what type of a job that you're applying for. If you're, whether it's going to be technical, whether it's going to be uh, a academic and so forth. Well, in the first century, and I'm getting a little ahead of ourselves, in the first century, there was a particular style of writing uh, called an epistle uh, format. If you read and pay attention to the structure, not on the content, but the structure of the epistles of the Apostle John uh, and Paul and Peter, there is a literary format of that time period. And they didn't invent this literary style, this format. Um, they were using what was common during the day. There's a book by C.K. Barrett. It's called The New Testament Background and Selected Documents. Basically, what this book does is uh, it ha it's a record of uh, extra biblical writings that have been found that parallel the style of writing of the biblical times. There's one in here. It's on page um, 41 in this book. And it's funny because it follows the very same format of Paul's epistles. Paul's epistles basically start off with a really polite greeting, you know, a, a blessing to the saints of the church, so on and so forth. He then lodges into a complaint, a moral or theological complaint, such as to the Galatians. And then he finishes real, uh, with a blessing uh, and a, a very polite salutation. So it's politeness, boom, get to the heart of the issue, and then politeness again, right? <laughs> if you're ever writing an email and you have to address a serious issue with someone, I highly recommend you follow that same format. Well, guess what? This is not just in the style of writing in Paul's epistles. It was also during this time. This is a third century, early third century AD. Uh, basically, uh, this is, a, again, this is secular. To my Lord and Father Arian from Thonius, greeting. Before all else, I make supplications for you every day, praying also before the ancestral gods, remember this isn't Christian, the ancestral gods of my present abode, that I might find you and all our folk thriving. Look you, this is my fifth letter to you, and you have not written to me except only once, and not even a word about your welfare, not even to see me. See, starts off very polite, and then goes boom, with a complaint, and then he finishes, I'm not going to read the whole thing, finishes up, Goodbye, my Lord and Father, and may you prosper as I pray for many years along my brothers that it may that, that the evil eye may not ha harm you. <laughs> it's the same literary format that, 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 that the epistles are in the New Testament. Well, in the same way that the literary format of a suzerain treaty, which existed during the time of Moses, uh, is used by Moses in, in, in the recording of of the mosaic uh, of the mosaic covenant so the problem with arguing for then a, a late date of the pentateuch and the reason why they want this because because they can't have prophecy you can't have accurate prophecies regarding what would happen to the nation of israel that they would go into exile you can't have that therefore you have to push the date of the writing to being much later they do the same thing with uh, the, the gospels for example in matthew 24 very clear uh, prophecy from Jesus regarding the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, we can't have that happening. 
uh, during his time period. We can have actual prophecy. Therefore, we need to push the date of the New Testament, the Gospels, to after 90 AD. They try to push it later. The problem with that is, and I mentioned the previous lesson is, if the temple, the destruction of the temple was one of the most traumatic events during the time period. It, it's somewhat like, you know, the terrorist attack in the United States that happened on September 11, 2001. I mean, it radically tra uh, transformed our culture and how everything operates in our country. Everything is in a post 9-11 era. Well, the same thing with the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem is if that had, if the temple had been destroyed during the time, which was destroyed during the time of the apostles, if the, if it if the if the New Testament was written after after that time period, they would have recorded that it happened. Second thing is is the New Testament is not written as a the way a Gentile would write. It's written the way a Jew would write. Those with a Hebrew mindset uh, and how you would write the New Testament or to write in Greek, but with a Hebraic background. Not only in terms of quotes of the Old Testament, but uh, allusions and references to the Old Testament. The other thing is, it, say in the book of, uh, in the Gospel of John, there are these references to, uh, detailed references to the city of Jerusalem. Well, if the Gospel of John, for example, was written after the destruction of Jerusalem and not until 90 or AD or later, how would you have all these details regarding uh, the city of Jerusalem in the Gospel of John if it's been gone for decades, if it's been gone for decades? Therefore, as A.T. Robinson and many others have, and uh, Kenneth Gentry have argued that the evidence, internal evidence and external evidence points to that the New Testament was completed before uh, 70 A.D. All right. So in a similar fashion, in terms of dating, but the liberals can't have that. They can't have prophecy. They can't have prophecy that comes true. Therefore, they have to push the date to be later on. But it doesn't fit the internal evidence of the document. It doesn't fit archaeological evidence. It doesn't fit any evidence. The only thing it fits is their uh, presupposition that miracles can happen, that prophecy can happen. And so the same thing happens with the, the, date, the dating of the book of Revelation. Now, added to this is what's called the JEPD theory or the documentary hypothesis of uh, Julius of Wellhausen, Wellhausen, he argued that multiple authors wrote the book, uh, the, the five books of Moses, and then someone else, a redactor, came along and fit the bits and pieces together to cr create the pe Pentateuch. And so, what they want to argue is, and I'll get, we'll get into this, and we'll talk about modern criticism, that the J, the Yahwist, the E, the Elohim is the pre, the priestly, and then the deuterocanonical writers. So the JEPD represents different groups of authors. But the problem with this is, and I'll get more into this later, is it doesn't work. It doesn't hold up. And this has already been refuted because of internal evidence in one scripture. And I'll go into more detail in a future lesson when we look at modern criticism, as well as externally. What Meredith Klein has shown, um, as well as Ray Sutton, is this structure of writing the Pentateuch didn't exist later on. So the late dating of the book of the, of, the, of the Pentateuch, particularly of the Exodus, doesn't fit archaeological evidence and doesn't fit in internal evidence. So archaeological evidence. So while there's no archaeological evidence for the historical events that leave no trace behind, such as miracles, archaeology continues to provide evidence of the accuracy of the Bible's record of people and places. And I see this in the news all the time, but it, and it's always been this way. Back in the 1990s, before the invention of the internet, and I would go to the library and would go through, was it called the Biblical Archaeological Digest? And what they would find is constantly over and over again in, in, in archaeological uh, digs is evidence of historical people, places, uh, of events that took place in the Bible. For example, in the, the Hebrew Bible, there's a depiction of the worship of Molech and Baal and Asherah. And there was a human sacrifice, particularly sacrifices of children. Just below uh, or south of uh, Jerusalem was a place called Gehenna. Uh, that's where we get the word hell from, in which these sacrifices would take place. 
And what they found as archaeologically is they found these mass burials of children who were sacrificed to Molech. Basically, the worship of Molech is, and a lot of the children that were sacrificed were the result of uh, having sex with temple prostitutes and worshiping Baal and Asheroth. Then, then what would you do with these unwanted children? And uh, they, they would then sacrifice them to Molech. They would heat up Molech's arm and burn them alive on Molech's arm. Basically, it was the abortion clinic uh, of the time period. And so they have found these graves that, that subst- in the place called Gehenna, this place called Hell, uh, a place where the, the the worm never dies and the and the fires are always burning, as Jesus said, because it be- later became a garbage dump when uh, Jerusalem was 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 taken captive by uh, King David. And became where the place of the temple. But anyway, but even during uh, Israel's stick neck period, even some of the kings of Israel would sacrifice their children in their apostasy. And this is where it would take place. Anyway, other archaeological evidence, for example, they have found uh, the, 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 the grave marker for Caiaphas, the high priest during Christ's crucifixion, and on and on and on. So if a person sincerely wants to know uh, and look into the historical reliability of the Bible and it really wants to look at the archaeological evidence, it is there. It is there. You could, I'm sure you can find it online. You could search online, archaeological evidence. There are books that talk about the archaeological evidence that supports uh, the scriptures. It's just a matter of whether or not someone is willing to set aside their preconceived notions, their, their prejudices, and Billy willing to uh, look at the evidence and show how it, it supports the historical reliability of the Bible. Now, obviously, uh, miracles, because they leave no trace behind, necessarily, cost crossing of the Red Sea, resurrection, uh, turning water into wine. Uh, obviously, there's no, there's no material evidence of that left behind. But the other historical evidence, uh, in terms of names of peoples, places, and events, uh, yes, these do leave a trace behind. One of which was the discovery of the Ebla archive in northern Syria in the 1970s, which has shown that the biblical writings concerning the patriarchs to be viable. Documents written on clay tablets from around 2300 BC demonstrate that personal and place names in the patriarchal accounts are genuine. The patriarchs are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in case you didn't know that. The name Canaan was in use in Ebla, a name that critics once said was not used at the time and was used incorrectly in the early chapters of the Bible. The word tahom, which means the deep, in Genesis 1-2, was said to be a late word demonstrating the late writing of the creation story. However, tahom was part of the vocabulary at Ebla in use some 800 years before Moses. Ancient customs reflected in the stories of the patriarchs have also been found and in clay tablets from Nuzi and Mari. I could do probably 10 hours of videos going over all these archeological evidences. I'm just presenting a couple of them. Second, the Hittites were once thought to be a biblical legend until their capital and records were discovered at Bogoskoy, Turkey, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. It was once claimed that there was no Assyrian king named Sargon as recorded in Isaiah 21, because this name was not known in any other record. Then this is common. They say, well, outside the Bible, where is this recorded? Oh, if if it's not found in any other document, then therefore we can't believe it. And they'll shoot their mouths off and say this stuff. And then, oops, archaeology shows, gee, it is found outside the Bible. Gee, what do you know? But they don't go back and go, oh, gee, I guess we're wrong. Wow, I guess we misspoke. Nope. They will never own up to the fact that they shot their mouth off uh, about uh, the historical reliability of the Bible. They'll never print a retraction. They will never put in the newspaper, I was wrong. They will never print a book. They will never uh, retract their thesis about the uh, uh, historical uh, unreliability of the Bible when the archaeology comes up and says, "Mm, nope, you're wrong. They will never retraction. You will never see a retraction because they're only interested in what supports their agenda. Well, Sargon's palace was discovered in Khorizbad, Iraq. The very event mentioned in Isaiah 20, his capture of Ashad, was recorded on the palace walls. 
What is more, fragments of a story at memorializing the victory were found at Ashad itself. Third, another king who was in doubt was Belshazzar, king of Babylon, named in Daniel chapter 5. The last king of Babylon was Nabonidus, according to recorded history. Tablets were found showing that Belshazzar was Nabonidus's son who served as co-regent in Babylon. Thus, Belshazzar could offer to make Daniel the third highest ruler in the kingdom, according to Daniel 5.16, for reading the handwriting on the wall, the highest available position. So here we see the eyewitness nature of the biblical record, as is so often brought out by the discoveries of archaeology. But just as Richard Dawkins has no interest whatsoever in historical evidence, this has uh, Richard Dawkins and all his fellow uh, atheists have no uh, interest in following the scientific theory if it leads to uh, the scientific methodology, if it leads to any conclusion other than the one they presuppose, which is that God does not exist. Well, another issue is uh, of alleged discrepancies is when there appears to be a conflict between two different texts within the scripture. So we have, though, examples of the harmonization of biblical texts, of how these texts can be reconciled. But again, the unbeliever, he doesn't care. They, they, don't, they don't care how you can refute the, that there's any contradiction or conflict. They will hold to their presupposition. The purpose, then, is to reveal how the harmonization of biblical texts resolves several apparent discrepancies. For example, according to 2 Samuel 24.1, God incited David to number the people. But according to 1 Chronicles 21.1, Satan specifically is stated as having incited David. The reality is the Lord tests his people to see if they will be faithful, and the Lord uses Satan as the means of conducting the test. The Lord's will is for good. Satan's will is for evil. This can be clearly understood if one compares the motives of Joseph's brothers and the Lord's motive, motives. As we read in Genesis 50, 20, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And we see this in the book of Job as well. Read the book of Job. Uh, Satan is wandering bound. God, Lord, where have you been? Where have you been going? Oh, I'm going here and to and fro. Have you considered my servant Job? And then the rest of the story is uh, Job uh, uh, is being tempted by Satan to renounce the Lord. And the Lord is using Satan to prove the faithfulness of Job. And so it goes through various, various trials. So Satan's involved, God's involved, God means it for good, and Satan means it for evil. The reality is uh, Satan is but a dog, He's but a dog, and God will use him for his purposes. Another discrepancy or argument that's often brought up is the issue of the genealogies of the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. This was resolved like back in the 5th century, uh, and, and, and yet, you know, hundreds of years later, it keeps being brought up. The, 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 gospel, the genealogical accounts in Matthew's gospel is different than Luke's gospel. Guess what? The genealogy of your mother is different than the genealogy of your father. Now, imagine if your parents were from the same tribe, the tribe of Judah. You're going to have some overlap. You're going to have some relatives, because you said both, and, and they're both descendants of David. So both Joseph and Mary uh, had the same historical roots going back. So there's going to be some family uh, um, agreement there's in, in the genealogy, but they aren't necessarily going to be lining up exactly the same, right? So the two Gospels uh, have two different genealogies for Jesus. One the biological one from Mary in the Gospel of Luke, and one the legal one uh, from the Gospel of uh, 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 Matthew in Matthew. So there is no contradiction or conflict here. It's two different genealogies from two different parents, a uh, foster father and his mother. It's not that difficult. But also you have to realize the, the purpose of a genealogy is to establish inheritance, bottom line. So you go back and read the Old Testament, read the Hebrew Bible, read the book of book of Ruth, is the person uh, line would continue, their inheritance tied to the land would continue um, by the birth of their, their, their ch children. And so if a man, for example, died without an heir, 
then a near relative would, would marry the wife and continue on that name uh, so that that person's name would be in the book of life or in the, in the, in the genealogy. So it can continue the inheritance. Genealogies weren't kept just for, for giggles, you know, to, to just know who you're related to as a mere family curiosity, but it had to be tied with inheritance. So you kept records of who your families were. So you know who your line was, right? So in the same way, uh, and when it came time for the uh, census, uh, you, when, the, when the Roman emperor had a census, you had to go back to uh, your birthplace in order to fulfill the census. And we see this in, in the Gospels that both um, Mary and Joseph, being uh, of the lineage of David, need to go back to uh, Bethlehem uh, because of the census. All right. All right. So, again, no conflict or contradiction between the two uh, genealogy accounts, just from two different lines. Another one is uh, the two accounts of the death of Judas. Uh, in Matthew 27, 5, it records that Judas hung himself. And the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 18, it gives this description of him falling headlong and he burst asunder in the midst uh, uh, and all his bowels gushed out. Kind of gross, right? So imagine there's a crime scene and, the, and there's two different accounts of the crime scene. One records it as it happened and how it came about. And the other des description of the crime scene descri describes it after the aftermath. So imagine there was a mass shooting at a bank. So someone describes the shooting as it happened at the bank, and then someone, you know, describes it afterwards as to what all the, the bodies look like afterwards. That's exactly what you have with these two different accounts of the death of um, Judas. He hung himself. Okay, and eventually his body fell off and poof, blood and guts everywhere, you know, and that's what happened with his body. So he, he, he hung, and then that's, that's, you know, Matthew's account, and then eventually his body fell off, poof, his blood and guts and entrails and everything else came out. That's the, that's the after effect. So, again, no conflict between uh, these two accounts. It's one's before and one is after between uh, the Gospel of Matthew and Luke's re record in the book of Acts. So as we began this study, we stated that the burden of proof always rests upon the critics. And thus far, we have examined a variety of representative alleged discrepancies, and we have discovered that there are not the tremendous contradictions in the Bible that have been so commonly asserted. In fact, the Bible is quite able to stand in defense of its own credibility. In addition, it is amazing that the number of alleged contradictions and discrepancies is diminishing rather than increasing. So as the more every day another archaeological found, uh, find is showing the historical reliability of the Bible. Uh, this also points to the fact that, give, that given sufficient time, they will continue to decrease any alleged discrepancies until finally they've been eliminated altogether. But the bottom line is, is, even during Jesus' time and his resurrection, those are some who saw him raised from the dead and they believed, and there were those who doubted. Just as I showed in the previous video, Richard Dawkins wouldn't believe in the Christian worldview even if he were to meet the risen Lord Jesus Christ himself, as he himself admits. He will not follow the scientific method to his logical conclusion. He will not believe his own eyes should he even see, or he claims to, see Jesus uh, risen from the dead. All right, I hope you've benefited from this lesson. Again, there's a lot more of this that could be covered. I highly recommend checking out the books that I put in the description box down below and that I showed you in the pre previous uh, portion of this lesson. All right, in the next video, we're going to get into uh, modern criticism in a short fashion. We'll look more at the documentary hypothesis uh, or the JEPD hypothesis for the book of uh, the, of the Pentateuch, of the, the books of Moses. All right, until next time, may the Lord richly bless you. Mm -hmm.